as part of our Spark Joy series. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Phillips. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'll tell you what, I wish they would get the woman who um, they describe in that bio up here because she sounds amazing. Uh, I'll tell you what, he, this is me. Um, I was with my son Charlie at home uh, a couple months ago and he had a friend over. The problem with having a friend over was that Charlie had all of these chores he needed to do before he had the friend over. So I walk into the house and of course, none of the chores are done, right? And so I say, Charlie! Blah, 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 blah. And Charlie says, but mom, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and Charlie's friend, who was 13, says, well, I guess kindness isn't always contagious. <laughs> <laughs> so then we moved to South Dakota, so I never have to see that kid again. <laughs> I am just a woman who loves kindness, and I believe that there is a bridge between living life and loving life, and I know that because I've gotten to cross the bridge. So uh, we're gonna talk about some tools that you can put in your pocket to spark joy and to cross that bridge, but first I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background, uh, because I think sometimes, you know, people go, oh, you know, she's a basketball coach's wife, how fun, you know, that's, that's great, or they feel super sorry for me, one of the two. Um, <laughs> But I think in life, we do a really good job of making it look like we're doing a really good job. Anybody ever recognize that? Yeah, I'm guilty of that. And so that's why I like to just start back at the beginning. And for me, the beginning was back when I was in third grade. I lived in a little farmette in Reedsburg, Wisconsin, population 5,038 back in 1985. And I had a mom and a dad and an older brother and an older sister. And, you know, we had horses and dogs and cats and rabbits. And it was a really an ideal childhood until it wasn't. When I was in third grade, my mom went back to work. And she got a really well-paying job at a men's prison about 45 minutes away from our home. Well, my mom fell in love with a prison inmate. And so when I was 10, I was the flower girl in my mom's prison chapel wedding. Every other Saturday we would go and we would visit her husband. And so I spent a lot of time in that facility. And as a 44 year old woman, I can look at that and I can think who takes their 10 year old daughter to a men's prison, right? But that's the judgmental adult in me. Because the kid in me back when I was 10 thought it was the coolest thing ever because none of the kids in my class got to do what I got to do. <laughs> the problem is eventually, I wasn't 10. I was 13 and I was 14 and I didn't want to be on this earth anymore. And so I tried to kill myself. And then I became 15 and 16 and 17 and 18. And then eventually I became, you know, my early 20s. And, and I decided that I wanted to become Miss Wisconsin. And I wasn't worried about whether I had the best advice for the people in the state. I was worried that I had some advice for the people in the state. And I did. This is the message that I told them. No matter where you come from, no matter what's happened to you, no matter who has done what to you when, from here on out, you make the choices that determine your life. Sounds like pretty good advice, right? You guys, I missed the boat. I missed the boat because yes, you can all create that beautiful life you want for yourself. And you can throw it up there on Facebook or anywhere else you want. And you can say, see, I've done it. But unless you're willing to take someone else's hand and help them along the way, you're still shallow, it's still a facade. And that's what I didn't know <coughs> until eight years ago. In 2011, I was on the edge of what anyone would call an alcoholic. I had taken all those bad feelings from my childhood straight into my adulthood and I held on to them tightly. I was the victim. 
And so I was a drinker and a smoker and an overeater. I was angry at my husband all the time. I couldn't understand why he couldn't make me happy. Life felt passionless and pointless and mundane. And yes, I was living life, but I was not loving life. And that's where I was eight years ago when I walked into the Fargo North City Pool. That's where we were living at the time. And you might know Fargo gets like one hot day every year. <laughs> and on that one hot day, everybody goes to the public pool. So here I am, my daughter was seven. My son Charlie at the time was five. And we had little Benjamin who was one and a half. And we walk in and my daughter finds the one open lounge chair next to a 17 year old girl with long blonde hair wearing a shiny gold bikini. And that, maybe that's not a big deal, but I'm wearing my mom suit that starts here. <laughs> you, you're laughing because you have one, right? Yeah, so I'm thinking, oh my gosh. It, I just felt embarrassed to be in my own skin. But I sit down and I notice that my one and a half year old starts conversing with the one and a half year old, that gold bikini girl is there babysitting. And all of a sudden they're sharing Cheerios and it's super cute, you know, they lick and then hand it over and oh, it's so cute. And then I notice that gold bikini girl is doing sign language with this one and a half year old. She's doing more and thank you and oh, it was so cool. And so of course I think world best babysitter. If I can get her to watch my kids, then I can go out and find something to make me happy. So I'm thinking about how to get her number without looking like a total stalker when all of a sudden Ben, the one and a half year old, mine, looks across the pool and he starts yelling, mommy, mommy, mommy. Now he's not saying, hey, mommy, look. He's saying, that's my mommy. Well, of course, I'm worried about social services at this point. So I'm like, no, 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 I'm your mommy. I'm your mommy. This is a basic fact. We've got to get it down right now. I'm your mommy. <laughs> Gold Bikini Girl starts giggling. She said that happened to us just the other day. Little Gigi was looking out the window of our apartment and she saw a woman with long blonde hair getting into a car across the street and she started to yell, mommy, mommy, mommy. Well, my heart broke because this wasn't the world's best babysitter. This was the mom. And she had far fewer resources than I did in a much smaller support system. And yet she was doing a better job than I was. We had a really interesting conversation after that. And a couple hours later, it was time to leave and we walked to the parking lot at the same time. And I got into my brand new minivan and she got into a compact car that had seen many previous owners. And something in my heart told me to stop and give her money. I'd never heard that voice before. I wasn't sure I ever wanted to hear it again. <laughs> But I reached into my purse and I grabbed everything I had, three $20 bills, and I walked over to her and I said, excuse me, my best friend died of cancer when we were 30 and I just, I like to do something every month to kind of remember her and, and I just feel like you and your daughter are gonna be these great catalysts for change in our community and, and you're just such a good mom and I just loved the way that you loved on your daughter and I verbally vomited all over her shoes <laughs> with my words as I'm throwing $60 at her, crumpled up. Well, I maybe gave her enough money to fill up her tank of gas a few times, go to McDonald's with her daughter, but I got back into my car with a high unlike anything I had ever experienced from any bad decision I had ever made before. And I thought, wow, if everyone knew what this felt like, then everyone would want to try it and kindness would be contagious. Well, wouldn't you know that about three weeks before this episode, I got a call from the publisher of the Fargo Forum and he said, I know you used to be on TV and uh, we are starting a section for women in our newspaper and I was hoping that you would come and you would write about politics. And so I of course said, no, no. no. gosh no, are you crazy? Oy, oy, oy. And then he said, would you write about cooking? And I said, 
No, because I've made lasagna twice and both times forgot to put in the lasagna noodles. <laughs> I may have been drinking, but let's not be judgy, okay? <laughs> so then he said, would you write about parenting? And I said, no. no. Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> no, actually I said yes. I said yes. When my kids have all launched from the house successfully and I know I'm good at it, then I'll write about parenting. He threw his hands in the air. He said, when you figure out what you want to write about, you call me. So I had this interaction with this girl in a shiny gold bikini. And I knew in that moment that it was transformative. And so I went home and I wrote down exactly what happened and exactly how it felt. And I sent it to the publisher of the newspaper. And I said, this is what I want to write about. I want to write about kindness. I want people to send in their stories of kindness, things they've done and how it made them feel, or times when kindness showed up at just the right moment. And they said, okay. And they gave me a weekly column. We called it Kindness is Contagious, and it still runs every Friday in the forum. And so I took a hundred of those stories and I put them in a book because I thought, you know, if people could read those stories back to back or to reroute a bad day, they could read them on command instead of maybe once a week. I feel like maybe they'd start to see and be more aware of all the kindness around them. So I did it for 100 stories. Then I did it for the next hundred stories. Now the funny thing in all of this is um, I'm married to a man named Saul Phillips and he's super supportive. And Saul, do you remember what you said to me? He said, he, he, he said, I'll run out of stories, but he was even more um, hard hitting than that. He said, I give it six months. In six months, you will have either run out of stories or you'll be sick, about talk, sick of talking about kindness. I love to prove him wrong. <laughs> Isn't it super fun? You could just prove your husband wrong. Yeah. So I had this weekly newspaper column, but the thing is when you have a weekly newspaper column, guess how often you have to write it? Every week. So I had to have a story every week and sometimes people would send me in their stories and sometimes they wouldn't. But I had to find something to write about, which meant I had to be intentional and systematic about kindness in my own life. Within one year of writing that column every week, I totally quit drinking. I quit smoking, I lost 30 pounds, I re-fell in love with my husband who it turns out is a really great guy. <laughs> I have found the bridge from living life to loving life and it was kindness. And I became so passionate about it that all I wanted to do was talk to people. Just please let me talk to people one-on-one -on -one or in a group. Let me share what this is because I can't keep it for myself because it's too powerful. And so how do you ignite that joy in your life? Does it happen when you write a check to the homeless shelter? Maybe. There's a lot of studies that say personal contact is essential if you want all those feel-good chemicals to start flowing in your body. You gotta step out of your comfort zone. And I feel like there are two ways that you can really spark joy in your life through kindness. And one is to see it, and the second is to do it. So let's look at the first one, see it. If I sent you into a birthday party, and I said, I'm gonna put on a birthday party myself. I need you to go into this birthday party and find everything that went wrong with it. Please make me a list of everything. And you would tell me the cake was dry, the music was too loud, you know, the decorations were gaudy, right? Would you be able to think to yourself, do you think if I asked you to go someplace and find a list of all the bad stuff, you could do it? Yeah. The problem is for some of us, myself was included in that group, that's our default. We walk into the post office and we expect there to be a line and for those people to be crabby. <laughs> so what's the alternative? If I said to you, I need you to go to the same birthday party and find all the things that are awesome about it 
and make me a list, could you do it? Absolutely. Absolutely. You'd say, oh, they had fresh fruit and it was so yummy. And oh man, they had a huge table full of, full of gifts for this young child. And it was just so thoughtful and so sweet. You could find it, but you have to see it. So the A number one tip that I give to people when they are trying to be more intentional about kindness in their lives is to see it. Expect to see kindness around you. The second one I said was do it. <laughs> That's easier said than done sometimes because you think, well, you know, I paid for that cup of coffee for that person. It really didn't make me feel any better. Um, I gave all of you, well, those of you who showed up early got them. Maybe you in the back didn't. <laughs> These cards say you matter. And I have a show called The Kindness Podcast and I recently got to interview a woman from the You Matter Marathon. No running required, my kind of marathon. <laughs> and she sent me these cards because during the month of November, she wants to start a revolution. And she wants people to hand out these cards to anybody. Because when we can look in somebody's eyes and we can say, you matter. I don't know if you've heard that today, but you matter. It matters. How do I know? I was talking to someone one day and they said, I, um, I try to be intentional about smiling at people. And she said, so I smiled at this guy I didn't know. Big toothy smile. Hi. A little awkward when you maintain the eye contact. <laughs> I didn't know him at the time, she said, but after that I saw him again. And he said to me that day that you smiled at me, I was going to kill myself. This is not a joke. This is not a hypothetical situation. This is real life. These are the people who walk with you out there and they need to know they matter. And so when I say do it, smile, give somebody a compliment because my friends, you may never know the way you transform someone else's life with your kindness, but I guarantee you will recognize how you transform your own. I am so glad you had me here today. I want to make sure you can all go off to lunch and do what you got, go back to work, do what you've got to do. So anyone who needs to get up and go, go, no problem. But anybody else who says, I want to talk about this kindness thing a little more. I got some questions. I would love to answer your questions or tell a few more stories or whatever. Okay, so no one's leaving. Okay, great. Okay, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, you're thinking of something you may or may not want to ask me um, in figuring out how personal you can be about things. Um, let me tell you this story out of a, from a, a man out of Fargo. He told me he was working on transforming his life, being intentionally kind, intentionally systematic every day, looking for the good in people. And... He said he was driving through this, um, this strip mall in Fargo, right in front of a coffee shop. And, and he said uh, a woman came from the other direction right in front of the coffee shop. Now the thing with the coffee shop is there was a drive through right? So they're both heading toward the drive through And he said, we got to this point where we had to stop and look at each other. And he said, through our windshield, we're making eye contact. <laughs> and it's not nice eye contact. <laughs> From his perspective, he said, that woman looked at me like, don't you dare think about getting your coffee before me. <laughs> and in that moment, she floored it, totally floored it, cut him off, went straight into the drive-thru. Here's the funny thing. The guy wasn't even going to the coffee shop. <laughs> he was driving through on his way to work. But we have a choice when people offend us. And he had a choice. And so what did he do? He stopped, he parked his car, he walked into the coffee shop and he told the barista, I wanna buy whatever that person in the drive-thru is ordering right now. And the barista kind of looked at him and said, okay, um, 
And I looked at him and I said, huh? <laughs> Why would you do that? Why didn't you just brush it off? It doesn't matter and move on. And he said, I knew I had a choice. I could go into work and I could tell people that I work with how crabby this woman was and that I had this experience. And he goes, and then everybody else would kind of join in, we commiserate together and they talk about all the terrible people in the world they know and you know, I'd be talking about politics and blah. <laughs> he said, or I could spend five minutes and five dollars and for the rest of the day I could walk around and think about how clever I am. <laughs> so that's what he did. What questions do you have? Any kindness stories you want to share with me? Yeah, please. Last week, uh, I was walking, I walked my kid. Hold the phone. Hold the phone. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I'm going to make you use the microphone. I'm sorry, but I'll stand right next to you so you don't have to be scared. It'll be awesome. We can hear you. So last week, I, I walked my kids to school. We live at by C.C. Lee and Holgate. I've got a sixth grader and a, a third grader, a son. And we work on kindness throughout the day and smiling. I really encourage that with my sixth grader. She struggles a lot. So we're walking, and we're walking across the grass. I'm waiting for my son. He's the last kid out of the school. I'm like, buddy, what took so long? Mom, I had to go to the bathroom. Dude, you could have waited until we got home to go to the bathroom. We're late getting your sister. She's going to be calling me. She's going to be mad. We go across the grass. We're just barreling along, and we see a girl in front of us. He waves at her and says, hey, Pearl, how are you? And we catch up to her, and we notice her backpack is hanging open. Her stuff's starting to fall out. And we, uh, I look at him, and I said, we get past him. Try not to cry. <laughs> we start to get past her, and I said, hey, it would be great if she had a new backpack. So we stop, he looks at his, turns right back around, walks to her, would you like my backpack? She said, absolutely. We notice at our school there, we give bags out on Fridays to the kids that are less fortunate and may not have food to eat. And uh, he noticed that because we've talked about, they've asked what that is. And so he, without hesitation, took everything out, gave her his backpack, put her bag into his backpack. And we continued to walk in. We had a conversation with her on the way. And that just made my heart so happy to see that. Mm -hmm. To know, as a mom, mm -hmm. one, you did something right with your kid. <laughs> <laughs> Some days you wonder. You're like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> just to have that experience. And now every day I have a bad day from then on. I, I just think, gosh, my, my son is doing that. Why can't I? Because he can do that. On a turn of a dime, I should be able to do that as well. Yeah. Kids are actually, thank you. What is your name? Liz. Liz. How about we hear it for Liz? That was awesome. Awesome. If, you, if you were in the back and you didn't hear Liz's story, she's in mustard colored pants. Find her and make her tell it again because it's <laughs> worth it. The interesting thing about recounting stories, well, there's two things about that. Number one is that kids are way better at kindness, I think, than adults because as adults, we worry, we get afraid. Like, what if they don't, what, what if I offer them money and they feel like I'm insulting them? What if, uh, you know, we live in the land of what if. So when you can live in the land of do it, see it, do it, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. And will you be hurt? Maybe. Have you ever been hurt before? Yeah. Are you still here? Yeah. So it's going to be okay, right? See it and do it. Now, the other thing that's fun about Liz sharing that story is that for, for you kind of scientific people out there, there are four feel-good chemicals that are released into the body when you do an act of kindness. So we have serotonin, which is like our body's natural anti-anxiety medication. Uh, we have endorphins, which is the, the fight or flight, but it's, it's um, a really powerful emotion into our body because when we step out of our comfort zone and we wonder like, Am I going to be hurt by this person? That's when we have uh, the endorphins running through our body. And, um, you know, these great antidepressants, it's wonderful. We have dopamine. Dopamine lights up your brain's pleasure center as if you were the recipient of an act of kindness instead of the giver. And oxytocin, which is the cuddle hormone. It's the reason, you know, like, 
It feels so good to get a good hug. If you're a hugger, if you're not, then disregard this. <laughs> so those all flow through the body. But the cool thing, the one that I love the best is the serotonin. Because serotonin doesn't know the difference between then and now. It doesn't know the difference between imaginary and reality. So you can have this great feeling from this act of kindness. And every time you tell that story, the serotonin is re-released into your body. It's why gratitude journals are so, um, so powerful. Because at the end of the day, if you can take a moment to think back on the day and the things you were grateful for, then your body is really releasing all of that serotonin. It's pretty powerful. And because you are all like sitting in South Dakota right now, I need to tell you something. It's okay to share your acts of kindness. <laughs> I know, I checked it with a pastor once because I was really worried, like, don't let the left hand see the right hand. I don't know, whatever. But here's the thing. Kindness works as a trifecta. The giver, the receiver, and the witness all benefit. They all benefit from the release of those chemicals. So if you are the person who is in line at the grocery store and you pay for the person behind you, you as the giver are going to have those, those feel-good feelings going. The person you did the act for, the recipient, will also have the release of those chemicals. But the person who's checking you out and the person who is begging the groceries and the person behind that person are also going to have the release of those feel-good chemicals. And so I urge you as much as it is so hard in our humble minds to not ever tell anybody what we're doing, share the serotonin. Thank you so much for having me here today. It has been so fun and go spark joy.